Hello, I'm Christoph Lambert. I'm here today to talk with you about building a happier career through resolving conflicts among our desires. I've been thinking about this for many years, and I think for all of us, we are in a constant struggle to find a, a place of happiness within ourselves, within our families, and especially within our careers where we spend, in many cases, the majority of our working hours. I'd like to tie this presentation a bit into the conference theme on reaching the goal. Now in the goal, Alex Rogo had conflicts within his business and within his marriage. Now, uh, conflict diagnosis and resolution is really one of the great gifts of the theory of constraints. And we find some of the deepest and most profound intractable ones are really the ones within our own self. And suppose we start with the goal of life as the pursuit of happiness. Can we make our careers really be that pursuit of happiness? And why for so many do we experience misery in our careers? I propose it's due to conflicts among our basic desires. And what do I mean by those basic desires? We'll get into that. And then I propose there's a systematic way to diagnose these root conflicts among our basic desires and be happier. But what are the necessary conditions for a happy career or life? Well, it seems rather simple, but, but it's do enough of what you desire and don't do too much of what you don't desire. Otherwise, you'll be unhappy and stressed out. So there's really three obstacles I'd like to address. One is we don't have clarity on what we desire and what we do not. Um, and I'm gonna hope to add some, some framework to help us articulate and get really clear on what our basic desires are. And then in trying to satisfy multiple basic desires, because we're not all one note people, um, this leads to internal conflicts. And even as we work towards getting through these deep conflicts, I, I, I believe there's, a, there's a, a challenge we face in this, in that when we, when we get stuck, when we get locked into a conflict, perhaps our greatest strengths are actually maybe what keep us there. So I'm first gonna take a little um, a sidebar here uh, at, at some length, and please bear with me, as I talk about a particular framework for understanding our basic desires. It's called the Reese Profile. It was developed by Stephen Reese uh, a number of years ago. There's a validated test instrument where we can really get at what our basic desires are. Now, how did he come to this? Now, are these the one true set of desires? What's interesting about them is he asked thousands of people what they desired or valued or wanted. And then he did a factor analysis where you're trying to find um, factors that are independent and that can um, that not be not be merged with one another and capture most of the information in what those 6,000 people said. And so he found 16 basic desires or drives motivating human desires. Say, well, what are they? The key thing though, is that they're actually all observable in the nature kingdom. Now, why is that key? I think it's key because it, it, it suggests to us that there are basic survival strategies where whether we're humans or primates or maybe even fish, um, we can observe these survival strategies and they provide some survival fitness and thus are observable. So there's a validated test for this. Today, I will not be able to help you figure out what your basic desires are. These two books are very helpful. Um, and there's also uh, people who offer tests for, for a few dollars to get it done. I think you can often just look at what these desires are and figure it out for yourself. But let me go into just what these are. So the first uh, eight of these in alphabetical order um, uh, are listed here. And so you see on the left, there's the desire and the description, what it's all about. And then there's this notion of people who have a, lo a low level of desire for this thing. What's their personality like versus a high level? And so it's not that none of us need, to, you know, someone have low desire to eat will not eat at all. 
um, but they may just eat uh, what they need to to get the energy they need and might be fussy about it. Whereas a high mode of personality might, might overeat. Um, and then we see over to the right, there's the feeling that, that comes from, from fulfilling that desire. So with acceptance, it's all about being appreciated. Um, criticism can hurt somebody with a high acceptance value. Um, they may have high self-doubt, um, whereas someone with low acceptance could be quite self-confident um, and they have that feeling. With curiosity, um, which is a very high one for me, it's this need to gain knowledge, to, to operate in the realm of ideas, they're intellectual in personality, versus someone with a low curiosity value could be quite practical and, and disinterested. And the feeling of satiating that curiosity, desire, is wonderment. Now eating, we talked a bit about it, the need for food, and it's, it's not just eating, you know, it's the smell, it's the texture, it's thinking about one next, one's next meal, how it's prepared, um, going to restaurants and, and, and having that whole experience, and that can lead to this feeling of satiation. Now, these, these short names, there's, they're kind of a crib for all sorts of stuff. Family is really, it's the need to take care of one's offspring, to nurture life, to, to, um, you know, to, 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 and you can of course see that in the nature kingdom. And so someone with a high mode of personality may not just be with their own children, but could be to others, is, is, is being a devoted parent and just nurturing and raising those children versus on the lower end, someone may really not want to have children and that, that could be just okay for them. Or if they do have children, they may be absentee and that feeling of love is what, what goes with that. Honor is an interesting one in that it's, we think of honor as following the rules or, or, or being, having high integrity and, and that is indeed the case. And yet its origin is being faithful to the tribe, to the ancestors, to the one's family or parents. Um, and so we see principle versus expedient or opportunistic. <clears throat> There's this real quality of loyalty that comes with it. With idealism, it's the need for social justice. Often we hear the word ideal and we think all kinds of ideals. And yet the, the test itself really focuses on, on detection and righting of those wrongs. So championing the downtrodden and, and on the flip side, those who have a low need for social justice may be much more on the, on the, on the spectrum towards thinking of a meritocracy and looking the other way with, with injustices that come in their way um, and that, that compassion feeling drives it. With independence so versus uh, <clears throat> interdependence or dependence, um, there's a need to be distinct and self-reliant uh, with order, it's this organization, structure, cleanliness. Um, you can see it in the nature kingdom with a cat um, um, grooming its little kitten or, or a bird building its nest. Um, so this, you know, often administrators are people who enjoy order where there's organization, methodical, into ritual versus on the other end, disorganized and spontaneous. And that feeling is stability is what comes with order. So the next set of eight, and then we'll, we'll put this into a framework of, of, of conflict within the theory of constraints. Physical ex activity is the need to exercise. Um, and so some people, you know, unless they're running a couple hours a day and weightlifting, they're not, they're not, they're not feeling vital. And, and there are those who, 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 who just, you know, uh, uh, have a low desire for, for physical exercise. And if you put, a low physical exercise value and, and high eating value together, you typically get weight gain. Um, the power value is an interesting one. In its pure form, it's really about can you exercise your will over reality? And that tends to bifurcate into you know, having your will over things and then having your will over people. And if you want to get really big things done, you know, and, and, and until we've had robotics and computers, we've really had to have control or power over people to have them as be an extension to our will. And so often the power word is charged with someone, you know, potentially having this negative sense of control. But in its in its true sense, it's really can one can one have one's will done over reality? And then we run into challenges with it on this when we bring in others and their will and our will may clash. So that sense of efficacy and, and accomplishment comes with that. Now, romance uh, and, and beauty, I've lumped them together and, and in, the, in the professional um, uh, version of the race profile, they'll focus on beauty so that in the workplace, they're not querying people about their sex lives. 
Um, and I think there, there, there is this, this idea that one can have, you know, the, the, the libido aspect of romance and then this, the pure aesthetic aspect of it and, and to what degree they're, they're correlated versus not um, is, is, is up for debate. Um, and so, so in the, in, in, uh, uh, you might think that beauty could, could involve just things, whereas romance involves other. Um, and of course, we see that, that in the nature kingdom and, and um, in terms of appropriation with peacocks and so forth. The saving value uh, on one end is someone who could be wanting to really hoard and collect and, and, and not want to, to let go of one's things. And the other end could be extravagant or spendthrift. Social context, really, this idea how much you want to be with others and the person who's, who's the life of the, the party, typically the extrovert who can't get enough of it, is energized by it versus the introverted person who might feel stressed out by too much social contact. Um, and social status, this is this need for social significance. Often you'll see formal um, and dis formality and displays of trappings of status. It's really trying to climb that hierarchy um, versus those who may, you know, tend, tend to dress down and, and often look down at those who, who, who display uh, those trappings of success. And so you often see people uh, on two ends of a spectrum um, not matching in terms of their basic desires. Now with with uh, tranquility is, is this need for security and being protected and not being stressed out and not having physical pain. Um, and on the, on the high end of tranquility, one can be, be timid versus brave, thrill-seeking, uh, seeking that, that uh, um, even danger. Um, and vengeance and is one we often in civilized society don't like to talk about, um, but uh, there is a good survival need of if, you, if someone's trying to take your food and you can bite them and get back at them for when they wrong you, um, that has a, has a survival advantage. And, and so we see folks who are, uh, say, uh, boxers, for instance, may, may, uh, may have a very high physical uh, uh, exercise and vengeance value. And on the, on the low end, we have the peacemakers. So with all of that, um, we, can, we can say, well, is that all there is to you know, human desires? Well, well, no, but in a way we can look at how to combine these to form, to form other desires that we would recognize and say, well, I'm all about, say, being diplomatic. Well, diplomatic can be around combining status with a low vengeance, trying to keep the peace uh, eccentric, someone who's both independent and, and doesn't really care what others um, think about them in terms of, 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 of status. Skeptical, somebody who's uh, very independent, but also high curiosity so in the realm of ideas where they're their independence uh, uh, is, is expressed. Enterprising, so as an entrepreneur might have low acceptance, high power, and high independence. Um, we can fulfill these, these desires vicariously through say watching TV. Um, I, think, I think we, uh, 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 sports is one of those, one of those uh, outlets for instance. Um, and, and, and here's the key thing, not only is it what we're going towards, but it's what we are having an aversion to that, that can be as powerful or more powerful. So what we're going away from. And so how this, this stuff works is, 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 is it's a process, it's a journey where we fill up desire tanks, someone who's highly curious to you know, read all evening, but then finally have enough. And then the next day they're ready for more. Um, somebody who has a low curiosity might you know, not read a book in, in a month or something. Um, and so we fill up these desire tanks, they become depleted. We spend most of the time on our highest desires and then um, overfilling, if you will, on desires beyond a tolerable threshold is a source of stress. And, and it turns out these desires are fairly stable over time. Um, they're not malleable, so they're really, you know, uh, unless you know through extreme things that we shouldn't be doing to ourselves um and and so we should really not be trying to fit square pegs in round holes and we're going to tie this to career in a moment um so uh what we really want in our career is to have our 
risk profile basic desires be really aligned for us that that and remember we i was saying we want to get enough of what we desire and not too much of what we don't desire so here's some nice examples of alignment a ballet dancer with high physical exercise with a uh, a high valuing of beauty and of status that is a very good alignment for somebody in that career if they have all of those three values uh, a soldier is someone who actually goes to war and, and and does you know can do physical violence so vengeance but honor honor to country to you know protecting one's you know the values of one's of one's tribe one's country one's ancestors and also a a a high tolerance for non-tranquility so having a low tranquility value a policy wonk, so someone who focuses uh, their mind on 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 uh, designing policies for government, uh, may value curiosity, power, and order. A scientist in academia, and that's that's what I do. I'm I'm curious, but also independent, so I can go after those things that are that are that what I want versus versus having to uh, do what others want. Now here's a key thing. People tend to fight over what are ones, you know, what, what are the, what, what's the best way, right? Um, but they're the one true way for you, for your particular constellation of desires, not everyone else. And if we learn this, we can save enormous grief in our relationships. Um, now most of us experience conflicts among these inside ourselves. Uh, and in, in the context of career, we have an important basic career is fulfilled, sorry, an important basic desire is fulfilled by the career, but, um, but the big but is either an important desire is not fulfilled or we're stressed out by regularly having to do something we don't desire much. And we're gonna examine these basic desire conflicts looking at my own, a career as both a CEO and now an academic uh, uh, career as a professor. And then I'd like to show you a way to examine yours and hopefully get to, if not full resolution alignment, at least an elevation and an improvement. So just briefly, uh, my career, I, I, I had a education in a bachelor's, master's and PhD in computer science. I focused my research throughout that time in, in the life sciences, I worked at a pharmaceutical company while I was at, at university. And then later I moved into building predictive uh, analytics uh, models in, in finance for just one year. And then I founded a software company um, in the field of genetics and was its CEO uh, for nearly 15 years. Uh, and then I uh, left that role, hired someone else to take on the job and, and became chairman of the company in a much more advisory uh, role. And I became briefly a, a teaching research professor. Um, and then since, uh, and then transitioned to becoming a professor uh, in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of New Mexico. So it's quite a diverse, um, quite a difference between working in, you know, in, in industry and then shifting to academia. And we'll look at really how my, how I struggled with conflicts among my basic desires um, in, in, in trying to find happiness uh, along the way. So without looking at all 16 of my Reese profile values, looking at the ones that are most germane to the discussion today, I have a, 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 a so these are calibrated against some population average of your sex and age. So I have a bit, when I took this test, had a bit higher acceptance than average. Uh, a very high curiosity, uh, a, 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 a lowish uh, desire for order, a moderate to high uh, desire for power, a very quite low social contact value, at least I was stressed out a lot by that at the time, and, and uh, a moderate status value. Now, um, what happens is, is the highest values, you know, that are one, two standard deviations uh, this way or that that really tend to drive us towards something, but also the ones that are quite lower really are aversions, those things that stress us out when we're called to do them. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> looking at, at first my, uh, this first of, of, of a number of conflicts in this role of a chief executive officer, 
there's this power value, which is tied in with achievement, getting one's will done, uh, you know, accomplishing things versus curiosity. So remember, I have quite high power and, and very high curiosity values. So generically, we're going to say in order to be happy, we need to have our values or, or I'll use the word values sometime, but the word values is pretty loaded. So I'm going to try, try to use the word desired. Um, but I think there are higher order values that really are constituent, uh, uh, constituently formed of these basic desires. So in order to be happy, I need to achieve things, have the power value be exercised. And yet I also, in order to be happy, need to have the curiosity value exercised. And in order to have high power, I need to be focused on project completion and pro process execution. I need to be focused on getting stuff done. In order to satisfy my curiosity desire, um, I need to be unfocused starting many new initiatives. Being that that butterfly hopping from flower to intellectual flower. So these clearly come into conflict, being focused versus being unfocused, just doing a few things well versus starting many new initiatives. Now, some of the best insights in, in, in resolving these evaporating cloud conflict diagrams is to look at what's called the jeopardy assumption. So why does D prime be unfocused jeopardize power? Well, if I am, um, doing a bunch of multitasking on many things, and I'll talk about that more, um, projects will not be completed and I won't achieve much. On the flip side, um, why does being focused jeopardize curiosity? Well, the assumption is finishing projects uh, and process execution is repetitive without novelty or imagination. So as you know, that last 10% to get things done, it's already, certain, it's not stimulating necessarily to your imagination, it's kind of you know it's going to get done, um, or, or you know what it takes to get there, and yet you may, may struggle to get it done and want to jump and do something new instead of just finishing things. So you can imagine this would be a struggle if you're trying to, trying to make money and, and you need to stay, you know, and there's the discipline of getting stuff done. Um, and yet you're wanting, you know, for the stimulation to go do other new things. What happens with bad multitasking? This, this has been explained well by others, but it, it, for those who, who, who haven't heard it for the first time, we, what do we mean by bad multitasking? Well, if you do nothing, you're not going to get stuff done. Um, but if you're doing too many things, you're also going to not get things done. So there's a sweet, so it doesn't mean doing more than one tasks is bad, but let's just look with a simple example of how, if we think of getting things done, multitasking can work against us. Um, and so consider three projects that each take 15 days, red, green, blue. If we started one on day one and did only that, we'd be done on day 15. Our second project will be done by day 30, and our third project will be done by day 45. Now suppose if we alternate among tasks and do a third of them uh, with each, um, with each uh, uh, slice of our time, and so we do five steps of task A, and then go on to B, then to C, then back to A, B, C, and so forth, we notice that task A is only complete by day 35 and then C40 and C45. However, we know that it's worse than that because there's context switching costs of going from A thing to B to C and remembering what we did um, uh, on A over here and starting again. And so finally, in this example, and it could be more context um, uh, switch costs, it's only by day 41 that we're getting uh, task A done 47.53. Now, how, three tasks is often quite reasonable to do. We might be waiting for somebody else or something. How many of us are doing 10, 20 uh, things in our life and, and, and rather than getting completion, we're, we're just smearing out into the future uh, our accomplishment. And so I have a nice article on this, uh, learning versus doing or why that PhD took 10 years that talks about this conflict that you can read here. 
Um, but the insight and why I focus a bit on bad multitasking um, is like, why do we multitask? And, and, and I think there's, a, there's, there's sort of a simple explanation that, that, that often escapes us, which is really, at this moment, I desire to do something else. And so if we have all these different value tanks we're trying to fill, Staying focused on just filling one, eventually we can become satiated with it. And so I think that, I think this is an unrecognized uh, 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 aspect of multitasking, which is being multidimensional beings who can't just do one, fulfill one desire um, contiguously for long periods of time are, are hopping among tasks, uh, uh, maybe driven by that. So, uh, I have another conflict, had another conflict as a CEO, achievement versus being rather an introvert and also desiring acceptance. So in order to, again, have power, accomplish stuff, I need to lead employees and hold them accountable. On the other hand, in order to, to not have too much social contact, in order to have high acceptance, I should avoid leadership and accountability. So what are the assumptions here? Well, I assume if I don't lead and hold employees accountable, the company will fail. I will have achieved no return from years of my life spent. On the flip side, uh, leadership actually requires a high deal of interaction with others. And this is the nature of power. If it's just over things, that doesn't have to be true. But if you're a CEO, uh, it is. And assumption two, people will not like me if I hold them accountable. How much do people enjoy being told that they did something wrong, no matter how you create the sandwich of putting the, the un, un, um, uh, favorable stuff in the middle between two slices of praise? Um, we still know what's coming in the middle. So um, how did I adapt to essentially deal with these, these, you know, trying to meet these, these four different values here? Um, and so what I did is I exercised my curiosity desire to discover and create systems, processes, and metrics to automate people management. And so there's also a key mitigation strategy, which is basically how do you, you got to do something that you don't desire but it still needs to be done. How can you work with that? Because life just doesn't give us the option always of only doing what we, what we desire. So if we must do something that's not normally congruent with our basic desires, reframe it in a way to make it more so. So for example, sales, which would stress out the, the high acceptance value because you know, two thirds of the time people are saying, don't bother me and saying no, and you gotta rouse yourself up. Um, to, to, to do it again, as well as being on the phone and doing sales, and I had to do a lot of it as a chief executive officer. Um, so it's just, it would drain me as an introvert having a low social contact value. So I reframe this um, through my curiosity value to the problem of discovering principles of change management. So a lot of what I did in theory of constraints was understanding the different sales approaches. You perhaps heard of the plus sale and the and, and the minus sale and so forth. Um, these are uh, uh, related to the, to the change matrix and so forth uh, that Alan Barnard has, has spoken eloquently about, about. And so another thing is, is you know, having to deal with customers, of course, is a social contact thing, but we actually, what I embodied personally and then it, it threaded through the whole culture was, was really making sure our customers were happy so that, you know, they, they were pleased and then we would get the high acceptance. So, so that would, that would offset the amount of social contact that would go into that. And so, um, so that was my adaptation. It, it helped, helped me function within, within the challenges of my set of, of basic desires. Um, but, you know, the big buts, in our environment, management by dashboard could not substantially replace human interaction, especially with sales. You create all these metrics, but at the end of the day, it takes that emotional oomph and, and being able to crank people up 
and keep them keep them motivated. And if and if that's not basic to to your own emotional foundation, you're going to struggle with trying to do that. And and I did. Um, no matter how much I tried to have computer metrics and you know maybe prizes and so forth, but but it it takes it takes that human interaction. And also the you know you can you can put things up and so forth, all kinds of measures on a dashboard, but without account, accountability, that doesn't drive behavior. So here, you know, in theory constraints, what, tell me how you measure me, I'll tell you how I behave. But if you measure me, but, but it doesn't really matter, I'm not necessarily going to behave that way. I'm going to go take an, a path that, especially if, if, if selling might stress me out as a salesperson, maybe I'll do a little less of it. Um, so that also gets to how do you pick people for the role. Um, and so I wasn't fully aligned with my basic desires. The metronomic, I, the repetitive activities of management, didn't exercise enough curiosity. The CEO role is, is intrinsically outward facing, requiring a high social contact. And while I value achieving this success, I was unsatisfied with the rate of growth of my company. And I had a bit of a mommy culture that needed accountability, uh, which would stress out my acceptance value of holding the line and so forth. And, and so all these things led to a certain level of misery within, within me, and then it would then extend to my organization. And it wasn't good for anybody. So I made a change. I hired a self-motivated CEO to run the company. I fired myself, um, and, I, and I joined academia. And so the pros of this is I can focus on science, and, and, and it supports that curiosity value. I can do new things, explore ideas, and so forth. That's what academia is, 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 is all about. The cons, um, in some ways, you're, you're another kind of a sales guy in academia. Uh, uh, often people say, you're a professor, what do you teach? I actually do research primarily. I have to chase grant dollars, and, and I have a, a small amount of teaching. And, and so, you know, writing your ideas, putting them out, out there in the form of, of, of a grant application asking for money, and then getting it rejected. And I had to go through 20 rejections before finally getting a win. I really stressed that acceptance value. And then there was a high administrative burden um, uh, within, within my organization where, where we had limited administrative support. I had a great administrative team in my company. Um, and, and it stressed my curiosity value, trying to do organizational things um, and paperwork and, 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 and tasks like that. Um, and also stressed my, you know, I like order, but I just don't like to do it so much myself. So how did I mitigate this and continue to mitigate this? I built processes to increase grant quality and chance of acceptance. Um, I hired self-motivated postdocs and students so I could get more done through them without stressing my social contacts and acceptance. I have a rather small team. Um, and I need, we're working on hiring an administrator who enjoys the work that I don't. Um, and, and the real challenge, by the way, is, is in, 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 in a university, there is more starting of things than any place else I know where, where the great challenge is saying no to saying, hey, that guy, he knows how to lead, he's managed, he was a successful CEO. And it's hard to say no with a high acceptance value and also a certain status that comes from, from, from perhaps rising in the ranks. And yet that creates potentially more um, need for social contact and, and the stresses that come with juggling way too many things. So, and then not achieving enough um, by being sliced uh, six ways to Sunday. If, if you're, it's an interesting thing that's done in academia. You'll, you'll put a percent effort on a grant and you'll say 10% of my effort will go to this grant and 5% of this. And, 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 and um, it becomes a way that you're sliced and diced way too many directions. And, and the same conflict come into place as before, focus versus anti-focus um, in terms of power and curiosity. And so, um, I found I've actually had to be even more disciplined in academia of trying to focus um, versus starting new initiatives. And, and it's, it's, it's the great challenge of academia. Um, um, and, and I still struggle with it. And you know, the path of growth is actually focus. 
and 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 um, and and so um, or have ways to scaffold having others do finishing and um, um, the detail work that may that may not satisfy the curiosity need but I find it it's very hard to not to just have others take things over the finish line um, um, you know I'll be the thinker and you be the doer uh, it, it, it doesn't work and so I've been striving towards a career more in alignment with my basic desires and one that it really would satisfy all of these and it's also congruent with what I was doing in 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 that CEO role with processes and systems and, and really the whole theory constraints body of work has really helped me with that <clears throat> is you know make my ideas materialize automatically at a rapid rate without the hassles of people management so we're moving into an era where with computer science and I have a basic foundation in computer science and with robotics, automation, and so forth, including laboratory automation, um, I may be able to move to a place of, of greater accomplishment, getting things done, where I don't so much care about power over people, I think, as just getting, you know, some big cool things done that I want done. And, um, <clears throat> and so, there may be ways to, to reduce the stresses that come from trying to manage some large organization of people to get things done versus something that involves more automation. I thought, I, I, and, and yet with all of this, um, I've, I've been, you know, I could definitely say I elevated to a place of greater happiness moving into academia and still these conflicts I'm in um, as well as, have I truly gone to accomplishing this automation of science? How much of my energies and so on have gone into it? Um, I have to confess, it's still, it's still in its beginning phases. And so I'm gonna talk, circle back to this a little bit later as to why is it that we um, still can remain, remain stuck even when we can cognize exactly what's going on uh, in terms of the misalignments of our basic desires. So, <clears throat> I'm going to go now into a process for career conflict resolution. And so I've, you can print out a slide like this and, and it's, you know, an evaporating cloud, but the formula is really, um, well, it's on the next page here, but basically identify the basic desire driving your choice of career. So you may have high curiosity, high status, high idealism, high honor, the thing you're going towards generally. So this will be the high value. And so that's going to be, <clears throat> what desire is most fulfilled by my chosen career. And then we're gonna identify the basic desire or desires you're most stressed or bothered about with respect to your career. And so this is something you're stressed by, maybe you're, you have a desk job and you don't get enough physical exercise, or you have too much, uh, you may have a low independence value, you wanna work with others and you're, you're alone all the time. You might be stressed by too much. And so that'll go up in this B box. And then we want to um, you know, put in D and D prime, the two conflicting, you know, what actions do you take or avoid to address um, that thing that, that, um, that also jeopardize C, what action to take to address C, it also jeopardize B. Articulate those assumptions and break one of those assumptions to find a way to obtain both of your desires or at least to get more of of those desires we may not get to perfection. So in here, you're gonna put in that new solution that, that um, enables you to break through one of these assumptions. And um, I'm gonna show you a, a concrete example with a case study. So I'm gonna talk with, about Dr. Belle Sante. She grew up in an impoverished nation she graduated with an MD degree from a top university in her country. This is a medical doctor degree. Yet she felt miserable and trapped as a doctor in her nation. And she moved to the US as a postdoctoral researcher. So not in the US, she couldn't practice as a medical doctor, um, but she was a life sciences researcher. Initially, she was elated to be one of very few to make such a transition to the US. Um, she always loved the US, it was the height of, of, of of, of 
where she wanted to be. She, she loved the sense of freedom and possibility that she grew up seeing on TV. And she's now, though, seeking medical licensure, but in a different specialty than her training at the expense of easier residency program acceptance. So she's, she's pivoting to a different medical specialty than what she was trained in, but that's gonna make it much harder for her to get in to, to a program. And it's also, by the way, really hard for foreigners to break into the US educational system for residency. Now she's driven to gain these credentials for the status and wealth they provide to gain new knowledge in a different discipline than one she's already mastered, so it's, there's a curiosity value, as well as a desire to address the suffering of humanity. This is idealism. She prefers solitary work and envisions her future as an MD doing limited patient work and mostly research. Someday she wants to quit it all and take a menial job just to relax on the beach, travel and take in the beauty of nature through photography. Right. She again feels miserable and trapped, neither moving towards being a USMD and alleviating the unjust suffering of humanity, nor being in a position to alleviate her own suffering. So it's a big story here, and um, but let's break it down a little bit. So in order for Dr. Belsante to be happy, she um, needs tranquility, she needs social contact, and she needs beauty. And she's not getting enough of these. She's stressed out right now. Uh, so she has too much excitement, too much stressors. She has uh, too much social contact. Um, and she has not enough beauty in her life. And so this would pressure her to don't be a US doctor. Go just go to the beach somewhere and, and uh, or, or, or stick to her current specialty and um, and not be so stressed by having to pivot to an entirely new field. Now this jeopardizes the, uh, the, the values, very strong values she has a social status. To be a medical doctor to her is, 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 a, is a very high status thing. Also idealism, uh, dealing with you know, the, the suffering of humanity. So, and she really feels that being a doctor is the way to do that, as well as, as P uh, pivoting to uh, uh, or sticking to her current specialty would be four more years of doing stuff she already mastered in her own country was a practicing doctor. And so it could be really, you know, uh, boring to do so, not fulfilling the curiosity value. So on the other hand, she's to be a U.S. doctor in a different specialty is this direction she's been trying to go towards, struggling with it. Uh, what are these jeopardy assumptions? Well, to be a U.S. doctor, it's stressful in general, as well as is pivoting to a new specialty, as well as doctoring involves too much draining human contact for her introverted nature and as little aesthetic expression. So being a doctor itself, um, with these assumptions holding, jeopardizes uh, high tranquility, low social contact, high beauty. On the flip side, giving it all up and being a beach bum, or at least just sticking to her current specialty, um, would jeopardize her social status because she believes being a doctor is the highest, noblest profession um, that can alleviate unjust human suffering. Um, and, and she believes her current specialty is not very effective at reducing human suffering. It would be boring to train for the same thing that she's already an expert at. Now, this is her actual solution, and it's it's, um, uh, right now, because she has not been able to pivot into that new specialty, is use a marketable, her marketable current specialty to move to a beachfront city with a high status medical school to get enough tranquility and beauty to in, rejuvenate and endure the uphill battle to gain admission there and be credentialed. And afterwards, get a lower stress doctor job in, in a beautiful location, perhaps staying there. And so you can see how this is a step forward um, and yet it's not 100%. So let's look at, at, at some observations on her conflict. Her primary conflict is really between social status and tranquility. Her solution's a step forward, but appears to not feel, fulfill both. But really, social status is one of these really challenging basic desires. It's, it's defined in, in comparison to others, and it tends to generate chronic discontentment 
the higher you climb, the stiffer the competition. And so the more stressful it becomes to level up um, in, that, in that hierarchy you're climbing within, which jeopardizes tranquility. Also, social status is a lot about who you know and how you can smooge with others and so forth with networking. But this stresses out those who are introverted and have low social contact, which is the case for Belle. So her solution seems to be kind of an oscillation right now towards tranquility, um, but it still holds the potential for future greener pastures of higher social status. Interestingly though, having higher social status greener pastures itself looking forward towards it can fulfill the desire. And so, and in some ways achieving the goal would probably create more discontent and stress. If you were both, you know, doing research and being an MD, you'd be, you know, in the rat race of academia, of chasing money, of high, high clinical service, working with people and so forth. And so in some ways, this, <laughs> this, this, this idea itself of future status and saving humanity from suffering is enough to, to, to sort of fulfill that desire in her head, at least enough for now. And Bill's a very driven person and will work towards it and no doubt achieve it. And yet for now, this, this sort of pause may actually be just what she needs um, uh, given the world is not, is not yet handing her a, uh, uh, you know, we're gonna put you up in the top of the hierarchy and you won't have to work hard. Um, and, and some people do manage to swing that by taking the credit for others. And so, 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 so the social contact thing, you have to be careful because often narcissism can come with that and, and using others, um, but we won't go too deep down that rabbit hole. So here's just a few more examples to sort of think about, you know, not me, but, Here's a person saying, I followed in my father's footsteps, which is the honor value. You, do, you know, my father was a lawyer or a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer or a doctor. But yet I can't stand being cooped up in the office all day. So let's say that person took a job that they didn't get enough of a high physical exercise value that mattered to them. And another example, I love the mental framework of TOC, of curiosity. So, and I became a consultant. TOC consultant, but chasing all these, this new business stresses me out. Why? Well, I have low social contact. I'm a, uh, and, 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 and acceptance, I have a high acceptance value. So being, you know, uh, dealing with all the acceptance of say, uh, the, the low acceptance of, of, of sales rejection is a real challenge. Or another person, I want to change the world. So they have big ideas of transforming the world and fixing its injustices but I prefer to work alone. And so this can be a real challenge if you're trying to get things done through others and you, you got to work alone. So I'm not going to try to break these conflicts, but, but, but they're ones that, that you'll find by having the power of knowing these 16 values, you can often slot things in pretty quickly and get the conflict nailed a lot, lot faster and easier. So I'd like to transition to one other uh, uh, to, 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 to set, set the stage for, for one other uh, view of all of this is revisiting the choice. So if you remember uh, uh, Eliyahu Goldratt's book, The Choice, that he wrote with his daughter Ephrat, there's this diagram where there's a virtuous feedback loop where, where uh, if our actions are informed by clear thinking, and this is really the injection of if we can think clearly, we can both get results and understanding. And then that will, you know, that success will lead to positive emotion and repeated success in, in an area where we can keep learning and, and doing and having success. We'll build a, 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 a congruence that, you know, what I think is, you know, uh, um, what I think and what I feel and what I do are all in alignment and it builds a sense of confidence and intuition where we eventually get subconscious competence at stuff where our intuition can just work without having to think and diagram and work everything out as, as, we, as we, you know, often find, if you've read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, 
um, there's a stress of operating off the conscious mind, getting that understanding, but eventually we get the subconscious and unconscious wiring to be really effective at something. Now, I've expanded on this because I was struggling a bit with the diagram of like, why is doing not actually listed here? It's kind of almost implicit, you know, understanding and results, well, thinking in, in emotion. And so, I, so, so I've been thinking for many years about, there's really three aspects to getting things done. We have to think clearly. We have to have energy and stamina to do so doing energetically, and we also have to feel positive. If we're depressed, it's going to be pretty hard to, to mobilize. And so these three things, all these plus signs indicate and green arrows indicate increase. So they'll increase our success probability, as will operating within one's realm of competence. Um, operating outside that competence tends to drop the success probability. As we have a higher success probability, we're more likely to get our intended results and we're going to get some satisfaction. Um, it turns out though that the, the higher the chances of probability, the more uh, chances of success, the lower our sense of satisfaction when we achieve something. So actually doing something that there's some risk and some lack of confidence that we're going to win actually gives us more satisfaction. Um, now, a uh, higher success probability um, uh, uh, reduces the chance of not getting the intended results, which jeopardizes our security. And we've all heard about the security growth conflict um, in order to grow, sorry, the security satisfaction conflict or EFRATS cloud in order to, uh, to have satisfaction and grow, I need to change in order to have security, I need to keep the status quo. And so anyhow, in getting our intended results, if we get what we desire and we've thought about it, we're gonna get understanding that yeah, this, this, this action leads to, to, uh, to uh, uh, this outcome. And through repetition, we eventually build that intuition, which can allow, us to do things with less and less energy um, and feel positive about it. And so how does this tie in everything we talked about today? This getting what we desire and not getting what we do not desire is related to this side. And then the not getting what we desire uh, and, getting, and, and, and getting what we do not desire, <laughs> so getting you know, what we don't want, um, is on this side. And so we, we, we actually see that not getting our intended results can basically sap us uh, from positive feeling, probably energy and even thinking. There's also this, this dynamic of, of, we tend to need to operate outside our competence to get increased, to lower the success probability and move out of our comfort zone and get higher satisfaction. So there's kind of an interplay between that satisfaction and security. And yet in the failures that come in really stepping out of our comfort zones, we can really get pummeled. Um, and this is where Goldratt talked about, we counteract this thing, you know, oh, it failed, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, to, oh, the thing's not going according to expectation is a learning experience and then that can gen generate into thinking clearly. And so uh, I, I um, wanted to build this, this little um, point of view to help us get a sense of why do our strengths maybe lock us into our conflicts. So Goldrat in his diagram focused on, you know, thinking was the way to catalyze this virtuous feedback loop. And there's doing is kind of embedded in there because I think, you know, doing almost was taken for granted. And, uh, but I'd actually ask, what is your weakest link? Is it thinking? Is it doing? Or is it the emotion side, the feeling thing, you know? And when you fail, which one of these do you go to to try to, you know, fight for the win. I found, I actually go to my strongest link, which is thinking. Curiosity value is my highest value. My weaker links of feeling and doing actually get neglected to my detriment. 
and the bright castles in the clouds that I'm multitasking, thinking and do this and do this and save the world and, 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 and so forth, aren't necessarily rooted in earth. Is that for lack of thinking? Or is that for lack of doing or having the emotional juice to, to feel confident, to feel happy that I'm going to do it? What was Ellie Goldratt's weakest link? He said he was not an intellectual genius. And people say, oh, he's this genius, he's genius. Well, sure, Ellie Goldratt is, is brilliant. But he says, I was not an intellectual genius. I had the IQ test from my youth to prove it. I, I am a bodybuilder, he said. And, and by, by bodybuilder, he meant I worked the muscle of thinking and, until it became very strong. And actually, I would argue that his weakest link was thinking. And if his very five focusing steps, which would say you need to subordinate to your decisions around exploiting the system constraint, he subordinated to the system constraint of thinking being his weakest link, and he focused there. And that was his true genius. So um, when I think in, in, of Ellie Goldratt, he had enormous will and ability to do. And his emotional presence was, was also immense. He felt deeply. And so he had those, those huge, you know, twin turbines there. And then the thinking, um, the thinking then became the way to mobilize all that. Um, and so as I think of future directions and try to feel and do towards them, um, I think about the Reese profile falling into a couple different categories, personal relationship with things, collective relationships with people, power being one of those things that can sit on the fence, maybe some of the other ones as well. Maybe even romance, you could have it with yourself. Um, and humanity has evolved in, in its fitness in a dynamic tension between the satisfaction security cloud and the I, me versus us, we. And I think we can understand these clouds deeper in terms of these, these basic desires. And also our capacity to exert our will over reality or power elevates as we gain personal mastery and resources. So that's this first one. And as we ally with people as a force multiplier of our will, but not subtracting from theirs. And, and it's really about reducing that loss of effectiveness that comes at the interfaces of people as well as the interfaces within ourself of apparently conflicting desires through win-win. And so really, I think there's a whole new path of, of thinking about accounting for trying to do win-win in terms of individual basic desires as well as collective ones. The organizations are going to have these core basic desires or higher order combinations thereof. And so back to this prior slide, the body of knowledge of theory constraint really directly elevates thinking. Um, through its catalytic mechanism, it can elevate feeling and doing, but perhaps not as directly. And so I'd really, really ask, you know, what are the, what is the, the, the means for directly elevating our feeling and our doing, our energy to do, our ability to have that emotional joy and joie de vivre and, and, and to, to, to accomplish um, so that we can truly be happy by mobilizing these, 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 these three aspects of self that are all one uh, and yet, um, and yet uh, 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 we fail to, to fully reach our own genius perhaps Perhaps not by thinking, it might be by doing, or it might be in that emotional world. So I have a few other resources here that are complementary as you reach towards your goal. Um, I, I wrote a, a very long-winded uh, submission to Ellie Schreigenhain's first riddle, riddle uh, that's on the TOCICO website that really you'll see the thinking of all, the genesis of all this thinking that was probably done eight, nine years ago. Um, some talks uh, that I've given, um, that Ellen, and Ellen Barnard's given uh, on, this is about the change matrix, wonderful way of looking at conflicts. Um, 
Kelvin Youngman really a uh, beautiful way at looking at, at, at clouds, at conflicts, and, and understanding different levels of abstraction within them. And why, why do some, why is it that some of these desires inherently have conflict is that they are not independent within a particular context. Um, and then here's a, a few other resources, a talk I gave uh, back in 2013. Um, Ray Immelman's book, Great Boss, Dead Boss, uh, the Gold, Gold Rats book uh, with his daughter, All the Choice. And then unfortunately, they've never been recorded that I'm aware of and made available. But if you ever can see a workshop by Efrat, Gold Rat, Ashlag, um, she's really developed some wonderful stuff on conflicts within our personality structures that, that, that you'll see echoes of what she's done in what I've described today. So with that, I will um, go live for discussion. You can email me if you'd like to discuss further. And I really hope uh, we can have some wonderful dialogue both now and in the future, put our heads together, our hearts together, our hands together to, to really find happiness um, uh, within our lives and, and especially uh, within our careers. So with that, I will thank you and, um, and move on to questions. Okay, we have some participants joining the Zoom. Welcome yeah. all. Please type questions. questions into the chat, or I guess Ian should be the moderator telling you to do that. So, no, feel free. Off you go. I'll, uh, <laughs> I noticed Deepag asked a question, so we'll uh, we'll see if he's, able, if he's able to join us now before we uh, address that. Oh, I missed that question. What was it, Ian? Uh, if Ellie's weakest link was thinking how come he claimed his mission was to teach the world to think uh, yeah well, that's exactly it <laughs> he focused exactly on thinking and um and as a result that that just you know turbocharged what he was able to accomplish in life mm, yeah well, so, once you focus on making something stronger it becomes stronger yeah it becomes, so becomes virtuous so um um there's an interesting comment that the Efrat made in one of her workshops that are, you know, not recorded or available. She, she actually, um, uh, she built conflicts based on personality types and, and she used the, the Enneagram as one typology that she was quite familiar with. Um, not that that's the one true way or anything to look at personality types. Um, and, and the, um, mentioned that her father was the, the um, the seven personality type in, in the Enneagram, which is this high energy type where, in fact, the path of growth is to focus. And that the, it, the biggest challenge, by the way, for, for those who have that type is to focus. And so again, um, this idea that Ellie made, he said, if there was one word that could sum, that could sum up theory of constraints, it would be focus. And so the path of growth, which was exactly for his personality type was to focus, he made it, you know, congruent with his career. And, and I think we've all benefited from the fruits of that. Yeah, so. I'd agree. I'd, uh, Deepak, welcome. Uh, Chris, Christoph just covered the question you raised in the actual session quite quickly, saying uh, it became his mission because he strengthened it over time. And whilst he may have started with it as a weakness, he worked at it. Do you want to add anything to your question? Yeah, I'm just saying it seems a little bit unlikely that that was his weak link. And he kind of had the vision to teach the world to think. And then he invested so much in himself that he finally became the doyen of thinking. Well, well, think about it. He, if, if, if indeed, you know, he's following the five focusing steps for himself and he focused just on the, the, some strong link and allowed some weak link to undermine um, his capability. So I actually look at where he focused and that would imply that is what he needed to, to you know, get the most out of and, you know, subordinate, uh, uh, capitalize and then, and then even elevate. So it's heretical to say, well, he, you know, he wasn't a genius. Well, 
but he actually said that. I mean, I heard him repeat it in, in several sessions where he said, I'm, you know, I'm, I have the IQ test from my youth to prove I was not a genius. I'm a bodybuilder. And we say, oh, no, 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 Ellie, you're, you're a genius. And indeed, yeah, the guy's brilliant. So I'm not trying to take anything away from that, but also to say, well, recognizing that, 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 well, what if that was his weakest link? I mean, do you, and, 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 and then the true overall genius of the man was, was that he was able to elevate that. Um, you know, we could debate it, but I think, I think um, looking at my own life and see where, well, I tend to focus more on the mental and the thinking, but what really undermines me tends to be the emotional uh, 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 part of that, that, that thing and and you know it's all one system if you will but but the thinking feeling doing uh um and so the irony too of of of, of i was waking up this morning preparing for the, for 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 this talk and and noticing that it fully escaped me i say in the end you know we kind of need to think about um you know toc is all these great tools, techniques, and thinking processes, and so forth to elevate thinking. Um, what are the technologies or for the doing and for the feeling, right? And, and, it, and I realized it escaped me that this talk is really about the feeling, which is my weakest link, because what are desires, but basically, you know, things, you know, that are coming for, from deeper in the midbrain, hindbrain, and so forth, they're present, as Reese showed in the in the animal kingdom and and um recognizing that my desire body could be sabotaging me for my own success um that, that then undermines both my willingness to think or do but and, and it's something we i actually this this came uh, up in a in an odyssey uh session years ago i think it's in 2011 or something this this recognition that you know like, you know, if we're so smart, why haven't we accomplished more as TOC experts? And well, maybe thinking's not the problem mm. for some of us, right? For some of us, the feelers and the doers who have that really strong, and you give them TOC, boom. And uh, so, mm. please, folks, type questions, comments. Um, if you'd like to discuss, also, just hit the, the raise hand button and we can unmute the mic or you can unmute yourself. Okay, well, well, well I, I, I just want to, sorry, please carry uh, on Ian. Carry on, Deepak. No, no, I, I don't want to belabor this point about, you know, whether Ellie was, uh, you know, converted his weakness into a strength because I don't want to take away just from your outstanding presentation. We really enjoyed it. You've kind of given us a very concrete, you know, kind of a framework to look at the Reese's uh, ratings and how do you really manage it in your career. But just to close this little topic that I had raised, I, I'm just saying that I have a feeling that a probable explanation for his opening statement, I've also read the choice a lot. In fact, choice is the focus of my work in the presentation that I'm going to do, which is part of active clear thinking. and. Uh, I think he refers to his being a bodybuilder and his IQ not being the highest was I think just said in the passing to say that, listen, I don't have 160 or 170 IQ. I may be 120 or whatever it is, but then I have actually exercised the choice of overcoming the obstacles that have that essentially come and impair into our thinking productivity. So I think he was just trying to make that point. But anyway, having said that, that's not the real theme of today's presentation. So over to you, Chris. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll pick a question up. Um, first, uh, Ruth. Whilst we were still in the session room, you asked about the slides. Hopefully, you've found those now. Uh, in the main session room, which will still be open, you can go back in. Up at the top left, or above the screen, there's a series of blue uh, buttons. One of them says slides. So, clicking on that, you should get the slides. If, if it's a wrong presentation, just refresh the screen and you'll get them there, or should do. Um, Christoph, uh, the Reese 
um, the Reese profiling. Do, do you know a, a reliable, quick, easy way of uh, individuals getting their own Reese profile as a trigger to uh, then completing the template you've provided us with? Well, I, I wish I could provide it or something, but I believe you have to go through some kind of training and then it becomes sort of a little money maker for you where you can administer the standard test. This test has, um, uh, is it 256 questions or 128 questions? Um, and, and so, um, I don't have a particular one in mind. It's kind of like you go through a, some person who's certified to do it. Um, however, the, the book um, that I showed in, um, in my slides, uh, the, the one with the yellow cover, it's, it's escaping me the name now. Let me uh, pull it up. Um, there's a quick and dirty uh, kind of uh, the Who Am I book, there's a quick and dirty test in there where you can basically figure it out. And to some degree, you can just look at these 16 as I've defined them and, 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 and kind of, you can tend to pick out the ones you really have a strong attraction towards and similarly an aversion to, and, and, and also recognize the kind of two poles, like the, the word tranquility. Somebody's talking. Um, that somebody, uh, the, um, the tranquility value could have also been labeled the excitement value and inverted, right? So these two poles of it, of, mm -hmm. is it something you're going, tranquility is almost something you're going away from, and maybe it would have been better labels as excitement. So um, um, the quick answer is you can, you could probably figure it out just looking at the slides, good enough. You know, especially with regard to your career conflict. Why did you go to that career? What were you going towards? And then, um, and why, uh, and what's the thing either you're getting too much or not enough of? It's interesting, I gave a, a earlier version of this some couple years ago to a set of graduate students and, um, and they were pursuing, you know, PhDs in biomedical sciences. And one guy, after doing this exercise, we had it in a workshop format, realized it wasn't curiosity driving him to be a scientist. It was the, the, the status value of having, you know, those, the PhD uh, after his name. And, and it kind of gave him a, a bit of a wake up call to academia is really about curiosity. And, and if you don't really have that, you're probably going to stress yourself out in the end. Definitely. Okay, any other Questions or comments or observations anyone would like to make on here? Yeah, um, another comment from my side. I'm just looking at the slide from the choice. And uh, Christopher, you've said intuition, that is at the bottom of the slide. And uh, you said it drives energetic doing and positive feeling. From what we have gone through in the previous chart and whatever we've said, intuition also drives thinking clearly because it actually is the feed to be able to get to the correct cause and effect relationship. That's one comment. But before that, I just wanted to check out with you. You use the term thinking clearly in that box. What exactly is the definition you have in mind for it? So this was just porting exactly the thinking clearly box from the choice, right? And so um, to answer the second part of, of your question, um, so thinking clearly, I would say um, would be would be um, what TOC has helped us to do to understand cause and effect, also to be able to resolve conflicts, which is both about causality but also disentangling. Um, uh, yeah, so he was talking about the, the next slide. So this one, this slide is is uh, a copy. Of, of the one from the book, I just, you know, put in my own diagram editor. So thinking clearly, I, I would also say it's the stuff we're doing with our frontal lobes. And I'd say intuition's the stuff that's the pattern recognition that has become less than conscious capability. So subconscious and un unconscious, which comes through repetition in a given domain, we can basically recognize patterns and something rises up within us and and gives a signal that you know that, that we need to heed. So, 
To be honest, I am do not. Um, I'd be very open to challenges of the exact causality of this. To what extent not getting intended results might also impact our ability to think clearly or even affect our intuition. Um, I mean, if you go back even to the previous slide, uh, uh, Ian, I was, you know, I was looking at this and saying, well, well. How are you going to get understanding your results? Where's the doing in this diagram of Ellie's? Right? And it was like so implicit that, well, doing is just sort of going to happen. Well, uh, 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 so I, I, think, I think this was the point of this was to show there is a virtuous feedback loop. Um, and the challenge, even in doing this, was if you go to the next slide of diagramming this, is it's all entangled. I mean, the mind is a combination of emotion, uh, conscious thinking, uh, intuition, which is which is some sort of a um, less than conscious pattern recognition mechanism. I just sat in on 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 Henry and Ellie Schra Henry Camp and Hel Ellie Schragenheim's uh, uh, provocative talk on on intuition, and a lot of people are saying, "How do you define intuition?" And and you know, you go to dictionary and in, in, in Wikipedia, it's, it's pretty much, you know, unconscious or less than conscious uh, competence um, or, or thinking that, 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 that we can do. And I think that's this, you know, as I mentioned briefly, Kahneman's thinking fast and slow stuff. The thinking clearly happens up here, burns brain glucose, takes an effort to do, um, we can't do it all the time if we're going to be affected because it will exhaust us, especially if we have a, a lower curiosity value. And the intuition is the stuff that can just natively happen with the, the wetware deeper in our, into our, in our um, neural net, so to speak. Um, and that's also why intuition can get us into trouble when we go into a domain where the pattern recognition doesn't nicely map. Now, the cool thing about humans is we can we can develop some generic pattern recognition, which I think this conflict mechanism is really cool because I found, you know, these, these, these 16 desires, I can look at conflicts within myself, within people, within organizations, you can actually map these 16 and, and quickly sort of get to the essence of things. So TOC's ability to look at generic clouds and so forth helps us move into situations where we don't have intuition and people can, can be amazed, well, how did you think that through? And, and it's because we, we've now developed an, a meta intuition about the nature of patterns uh, across domains. And so we're better able to operate outside of our specialty or area of competence by theory of constraints thinking processes. Yeah, just to comment on that, Ian, is that okay? Or are there other people Waiting to speak, in which case I'll take. Uh, we we I'll just, take, I'll just, just thank, to, thank you. But carry on, Deepak. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No. First of all, Christoph, I think the fact that you took the diagram on intuition, logic, and emotion, and then you brought in the element of doing and and feeling to thinking is a very important one. So, mm -hmm. notwithstanding any minor correction in the diagram, but I think it it def, the expanding the choice, I think, was a very good idea. And I, I agree with you that intuition perhaps is feeding positive feeling and, you know, the, the, the thinking part is only, is the cerebral thing that we do to get the cause and effect relationships right per se. And it's assumed that that intuition is the one which was anyway feeding the thinking clearly process per se. By the way, I am touching upon Daniel Kahneman's S1 and S2 intuition and thinking clearly under my topic power of active clear thinking so anybody who has you know kind of an interest in knowing a little bit more of this uh, most welcome to come into my session which is track four on the last day it's the last session of the last day in track four. Oh, we're finishing in style are we deep back yes <laughs> <laughs> well it looks like this the end of the questions uh you've been quite a silent bunch i hope i hope um I hope you feel free to to uh, communicate with me uh, via email. It's it's at the, on the final slide, um, or or um, yeah, I guess that's probably the best way to do it. And sure. um, 
really grateful for your attention and your interest in this topic. It's, you know, and I think, I hope I've conveyed also that, that um, it's an ongoing journey. I think one elevates and there's only so much change we can do. Um, perhaps some of you came here because you've you struggled with, with, with where you've been and, and some of us have even been miserable at times in our in our careers and and so i hope i hope this you know you you give it a shot try this this process um, um and and hopefully move to a place of greater happiness if not the ultimate happiness and i think that's this this journey towards the coal and it's the towards that's the key uh the reaching i think tends to lead to well what's the next thing and and so um um all the best in your in your reaching towards the goal. Well, thank, thank you, you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Okay, Thanks. Deepak, we'll see you soon. And uh, looks like we coordinated the colours very well, Christoph. <laughs> it was like a time thing, I saw. Yeah, oh, yeah. These are all three great beige <laughs> blues, yeah. The illusion okay. of <laughs> my hair's longer if one was to, uh, you know, haven't got to a barber yet in this pandemic. Yeah, so we've, we've uh, yeah. We've got uh, Ram Rami is going off to uh, have a look at the template, so he, he may be in touch. Or okay. To get some books. okay, we've come to the formal end for today. Thank you very much. Uh, if you can click on the link and give some uh, feedback about today, that would be appreciated. Uh, pop in and see the exhibitors and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, around tomorrow and for the rest of the week. In, in just one clarification in that feedback thing, there's a yep. lot of confusion between the session and the event. In the event meaning the day. So it, you, know, you don't know whether you're actually commenting on the, on the session or you're commenting on the day and the two feelings could be slightly different. And it's very okay. difficult to disentangle them and put them in, you know, conveniently. Not, it's not a very user-friendly way to Okay, I think I think it's been clarified. The one that I've sent you for is feel free to do it for the whole event on Friday or each day, and they'll be looked at each day just to see if there's anything that needs to be picked up, because we are looking to uh, continuously improve and fix the uh, the things that we learn about the platform. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Okay. Thanks, Deepak. Thank you. Bye. See you all soon. Cheers. Bye.